the wise men showed up. He was troubled. He gathered together the chief priests and scribes and Pharisees and asked where the child was to be born. And they quoted out of Micah that he was to be born in Bethlehem. Uh, and then they all got together. Herod got his family together and they loaded up on camels and donkeys and put great riches uh, together and all the scribes and Pharisees got their priestly robes and, and, and they were all got together to go with the wise men to greet this Messiah who was to come, right? <laughs> Not exactly, right Josh? <laughs> Not right at all, is it? It amazes me, isn't it? Oh, I know Herod. Herod is wickedly cruel and dark to the very bone of his, every bone of his body. I mean, he is, he is so focused on himself and so focused on his own self-interest uh, that he's not going to go see the king. He would even like to stop the wise men from seeing the king, but you see, he was also politically cunning, like we said before, right? He was politically cunning. He knew he couldn't take these very important men from other nations and be a party of doing something wicked in their presence. So he found out when the child was born so he could make his nefarious plans around that time. So he could make his dastardly deed <laughs> occur after they were out of the picture. So he made the plans. Okay, you go see him, and when you come back, tell me where he is, and then I'll come down and worship him too. Do you think he had any intention of worshiping him? Obviously not. Obviously not. Uh, we, from what we know of his character, from what we know what he has already done up to this point, it's no surprise at all what he did after this, is it? Why should we be surprised that all the evil would take place with these children when Herod had already shown who he really was before? So uh, Herod couldn't allow them to do what they wanted, but God had other plans. Herod could not stop Christmas because God intervened. God arranged for the wise men uh, to be the ones who carried the news to Herod. And Herod knew that he couldn't uh, not uh, treat the wise men properly, so he made the other plans. The Magi did not return with the information. God gave them a dream uh, to where they knew they should not go back to Herod, that they should depart for their country another way, as the scripture says. Uh, that was a kink in, in his plans. And finally, the angel appeared to Joseph and Mary and said, Herod's plan to do something terribly wicked, flee to Egypt. God, in the midst of this terrible evil, God still worked out his plan. Isn't that something? God still worked out his plan. I, I just can't help but visit some current situations right now. There's evil in our world today, too, isn't there? In Herod's day, he sent and had all the children who were two and younger killed in Bethlehem. Oh, what a terrible, terrible wailing and mourning in the whole city <clears throat> as each family that had a child that age was grieving for the loss of their child. I know that in Sandy Hook Elementary, I know that in Connecticut, but there's grieving and wailing going on, isn't there? Another picture of where evil has shown its dark, ugly face, or where evil has seemed to reach in and, and grab all the joy out of people's hearts and replace it with a terrible foreboding. But ultimately, God's still in control. Ultimately, God still has a plan. And as much as I hate to say it, evil seemed to triumph in the headlines but God ultimately triumphs in the end. Amen? Amen? And those children that breathed their last that cold day on this earth breathed their first in the warm sunshiny presence of Jesus that very next moment isn't that true? According to the word of God, I would say to you, in Bethlehem that it was true, and it was true at Sandy Hook Elementary as well. Evil.
evil men may do evil things because God has allowed men free will. And men can choose to do terrible things. But God's still God. And he's still working within those bad situations ultimately to love and to care and to bring about his ultimate rule. It will never be perfect until Jesus comes again. Amen? And I look forward to that day when he does. What are some lessons that we can learn from this passage? What are some lessons that, that we can get uh, from Herod? You know, I, I've told you before in my prayer is that some of the best lessons I've ever learned has, has been what not to do. What not to, if my son was here, uh, <laughs> he wouldn't like me telling the story. <laughs> but when he was a teenager, like some of you guys... <laughs> Uh, and he was caught in doing something particularly not right. <laughs> uh, he said, Dad, don't you know I have to make my own mistakes? <laughs> I looked at him and I said, Son, that is the stupidest thing you have ever said. Why do you have to make your own mistakes? There's people all around you making all kinds of mistakes. Why can't you learn from them? <laughs> You see the consequences. You see the, the bad things that happen because of the decisions they make. You don't need to make that decision because there are already experiences of the consequences of it, right? A wise person's going to say, hey, <laughs> I'm not going to do what you're doing because <laughs> I see what's happening, right? I don't have to make those mistakes. I can make better choices because I look around at the mistakes that people make. But what can we learn from Herod? What can we learn from his mistakes? Well, first of all, I think we can learn that evil is real. It's deep and it's dark. It's pervasive. It, it affects every part of our world. But it is subject to God. You, you understand what I'm saying? God does give us a free will, and he does allow us to make our mistakes but ultimately, he is still carrying out his plan. And we are one day closer to things being made right. Amen? Uh, evil is real. Man is bent towards evil. You know what I mean? Uh, Paul's dilemma in uh, Romans chapter 7, uh, our dilemma that we inherit sin and an inclination towards sin, uh, that every thought and intention of our heart get going its own way is going to be evil. Amen? Right? Man is basically bent towards evil. Power corrupts. Herod had ultimate power, and he was ultimately corrupted. Right? Uh, Self-interest drives poor decisions. Look on the front of your bulletin. There's a passage of scripture that I quote there on the front of the bulletin that I want you to, to note with me. It's, it's uh, found in Philippians 2, which Philippians 2 is an awesome chapter. It talks about how God sent Jesus. But Paul says this in verse 4. He says, do not merely look on your own interests, but also for the interests of others. When your self-interest is all you care about, then you're going to make some bad decisions, right? If it's all about you, it's going to result in some bad things. But when you begin to look around and make decisions based on what God wants you to do, what other people are in your life, those are going to be better decisions. Compromise always leads to greater compromise. I don't know how Herod started. I don't know when he began to compromise. His dad was sure no saint. Uh, he got his position by intrigue and, and uh, terror, and so it carried on to his son. But his ordering his de the death when he was 18 led to another death a little bit later, another death, another death, another death, and pretty soon death was just his MO. That's the way he rolled. I mean, that's just who he was. Uh, it became more and more part of his life. And, and folks, uh, you may think that, that I can do this much and it's going to be all right. But you know what happens when you go that far? Your perspective changes. And
and it doesn't look that bad to go that far, much farther, because your perspective changes, and it doesn't look that bad to go that much farther, and you end up way down here, a place you never would have thought you would ever be, right? When you were here, you never thought you'd be there. You, you never would go there, not in your wildest imagination. How did you end up there? Because of this. Little compromises lead farther and farther and farther down the road. That's how evil pervades our society. It's one little compromise at a time. Well, the other thing I want you to see here is that every decision we make affects others. Personal decisions bring personal consequences. It affects you. Because it affects you, it affects others. Because it changes who you are. If you choose to make bad decisions and live a sinful life, it's going to affect you enough that it will affect even those that you love around you because you're different. You understand what I'm saying? Even if the sin you commit doesn't have a direct correlation to what they're going through because you're different, then your relationship with them changes and it affects them as well. But beyond that, beyond that, my decisions will also affect my family. I want you to see this next slide. This is from the uh, Nativity movie. It's a picture of Herod talking with his son. Uh, do you know why Jesus didn't go, or Joseph didn't take Jesus back into Bethlehem? You see, he had time enough there to establish his home there. It would have been natural for him to come back after a couple of years, now that Herod was died, and come back to his latest home and, and the, the business he had established there. That would have been a natural thing for him to do. You know why he didn't do that? Because Herod's son was now on the throne. And Archelaus was not much different than his dad. What he did after he became the ruler of, of Judea, it was the kingdom was split up into three parts. And his part was the Judean region. He got a kind of a double portion. Uh, and after he became ruler, he ordered the death of 9,000 Pharisees. That's pretty, pretty cruel, wasn't it? Pretty evil. Can you see why God skirted Jesus around that and Jesus' family up to Nazareth? Where Herod's other son, who was much kinder, much less affected by the sins of his father, where he was in charge instead. My decisions really ripple through others' worlds. That's true, isn't it? My decisions ripple through other worlds. The decisions I make make a difference in everybody around me to some degree, some larger than others. For my children, it makes a greater impact than it does perhaps for someone else's children in my world, right? But it does make an impact. And not only that, Others' decisions ripple through my world. Others' decisions ripple through my world. And I have to be prepared for both, don't I? I have to be prepared, hopefully, to make the right decisions that will ripple through people's world. And I have to be prepared for others' wrong decisions to ripple through my world. You know, like when somebody cuts you off in traffic. Something really terrible like that. <laughs> no, far worse than that, honestly. Far worse than that. You'd be amazed if you tracked down the influence of single decisions. You'd be amazed at how they impact multiple people uh, over a short amount of time. Well, so what's the answer? Well, the answer is God. God can change me, which changes my decisions, which changes my influence, which changes my world. Right? God can change me. It all ends and begins with God. God can change me, and that can make all the difference in every place else. You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I do believe that Herod is in hell today. From the account in the Bible, I see no sign of repentance. Uh, even at his death when he had all those people killed, I see no sign of him turning around. I believe he's in hell. But I also believe that God wanted him to be in heaven. Because I read in Peter that God is not willing that anybody should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Herod made poor ch 
choices and poor decisions that hardened his heart to the things of God so that he could not be reached, so that he hardened his heart so much that anything God did, like send his son as a savior in a manger in Bethlehem, could not touch him because he was so far gone. I pray that we're not in that position today. I know we don't have the abundance of power, and I don't know how many mansions you have built, but <laughs> I'm kind of low on mansions, especially my son. I know we don't have a great position, perhaps, of influence like he had, but we can just be as wickedly sinful as he have and have none of those things, can't we? The message I have for you is that God loves you no matter what you have done. Amen? And God has a plan for your life no matter where you are today. Maybe you haven't sought the interest of others. Maybe you only live for yourself. God wants you to know him who gave up everything to die on the cross for your sins so that you can be saved, so that you can care about you can be a light in this world. You see, in the darkness of that day, you understand how dark it was <laughs> to have Herod the king on the throne? How dark it must have been in that day? To have the wholesale killing of babies with no consequence. No con Everybody knew who did it. Everybody knew it was unfair and unjust, but there's no consequences for it. They didn't ban swords or, <laughs> or guns or anything in that day. It, there just wasn't any consequence at all for this terrible, terrible m murder of these innocents. No consequences at all. Yeah, there was. There were ultimate consequences to pay, weren't there? We have every one of us to answer before a holy and a just God. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We will all answer before God someday. Why not answer here now for our sin? Repent. Ask God to forgive us now. So when that day comes, we can just rejoice that our sins are covered by the blood of Christ. That Christmas really did matter for us that we kept Christmas in our heart because Jesus was in our heart. Amen? Are you today the Grinch? Or are you today one of the other characters that knelt there and worshiped God, the wise men that loved God and sought out his son? His son's all the difference. How what you do with Jesus makes all the difference in the world. Make sure you know Jesus today. Would you bow with me, please, in prayer? Our Father, we thank you for a Christmas some 2,000 years ago that changed the world, that gave us the opportunity to be forgiven of all of our sins and to be born into a new and better life, to have eternal hope and a home in your glorious heaven. Father, I pray for anyone who's here today that they would learn the lesson from Herod and not let evil determine their direction, determine their priorities, determine their decisions, ultimately, and Lord, determine where they spend eternity. Instead, Father, may we confess our sins before you. For you are faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to come, Lord, to be our Lord and our Savior. If we will call upon your name, you have promised we will be saved. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help all of us sinners here today to call upon your name. Lord, if we haven't given our heart to you as Lord and Savior, may this be the day, may this be the hour of salvation in our own hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you please stand with me? If God has spoken to your heart, I invite you uh, to come and make that decision that God wants you to make this morning. Uh, perhaps he's spoken to your heart about salvation, knowing Christ, knowing him as our Lord and Savior.
Maybe it is about a rededication. You've compromised and compromised and compromised and you're someplace you never thought you would be. But you can get back. You can get back. The way is on your knees. That's the way to get back. Why don't you come as God speaks?